Hey guys, this is Butch from the Vintage Media Grading Podcast. And before we start, I just want to give a shameless plug to Vintage Media Grading. VMG is your source for grading, authenticating, and slabbing your precious vinyl records. In addition, we offer a host of other services, including cleaning and sticker removal, as well as soft grading, which is a way to get your albums graded, but still allow you to spin your records and listen to your tunes. Come visit us at www.vmgvinyl.com to place your orders, or feel free to contact us at info at vmgvinyl.com. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Vintage Media Grading, the podcast. We are here, episode nine. Uh, We are thrilled to have on our show a special guest today, someone who played a critical role in the early inception and promotion of grunge music. Daniel House is in the house, (laughs) co-founder and bass player for the grunge band Skin Yard. Uh, Daniel was president and owner of CZ Records, a Seattle-based independent record label that released music by the bands Built to Spill, Coffin Break, Engine Kid, The Gits, Hammerbox, Love Battery, The Melvins, The Presidents of the United States of America, Silkworm, and Skin Yard. So, Daniel, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well, doing well. We have here with us also Paul and Chad Brayman from VMG. How are you guys? Great. I'm good. Glad, excited. Glad to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, Daniel, it's it's an honor to have you on the show with us. Uh, as we were talking a little bit before the show, uh, we are fanboys of not only grunge music, but also early grunge. Uh, that's something that um, floats our boat, gets us going. Uh, so uh, we have a lot to talk about, I'm sure. So uh, before we jump in uh, to your band of choice, um, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. If I got any of the details wrong about uh, your past, uh, you could correct me as well, but uh, just kind of fill us in a little bit about your career, and uh, we can go from there. It's it's uh, it's kind of funny to even talk about it in terms of it being a career because it was just kind of where we were at and and, and what we were doing, I guess you know. Uh, but but I guess if I'm gonna if I'm gonna you know recite my my uh, grunge resume, um, <laughs> I. Uh, I moved to Seattle in 1981 as a very young man. And I was just like, all I knew is that I wanted to be in a band. I wanted to write original music. I wasn't really sure what the music would even sound like. I just, it was a passion that I had just having been, you know, a, a Uber fanboy of the music I was into at the time. And I always had music kind of, pumping through my head i still do i still hear music that i don't know where it comes from and so often that's where a lot of stuff that i worked on would, would sort of pop out of nowhere um and uh you know i had the opportunity to join one band that nobody's ever heard and that's fine because we were terrible <laughs> um but you know in I, I i played a lot and i got better really quick and uh uh in 1984 I um, I was playing two bands simultaneously. One was a band called Feedback, uh, which was the first band I was in with uh, with Matt Cameron. Mm-hmm. Me and him and this uh, guitar player name who called himself Nerm, N E R M, um, and we were kind of an instrumental, kind of cerebral. Some people say kind of proggy. It was sort of proggy, but it was just kind of weird art rock, I guess. Uh, but, you know, being an instrumental band at that time didn't really float many people's boats. And at the same time as when this band called uh, Ten Minute Warning. Mm-hmm. And that was a band that that 
Duff McKagan had been in, it was the last band he was in before he went to, uh, to LA in 83 and him and the bass player, David Griggs left in 83. Uh, and they were at that time, they were my favorite band in Seattle and I'd become friends with David and I was pretty good friends with Steve, the singer. Um, and so I kind of sheepishly, you know, fished around and to see if maybe there might be the opportunity to, to try out because I'm like, you know, if I don't, if, if I don't at least try to try out for my favorite band in this, in Seattle, I'll kick myself forever. And uh, so I did. And uh, they never tried anybody else. So I was playing these two bands, very, very different kinds of bands at the same time. And uh, mm-hmm. it lasted through that. Through Ten minute warning that that's a band that uh, as, as grunge fans and growing up in, uh, the nineties and you start to learn about the, the, I don't want to say pre grunge, but the, the mid eighties bands from Seattle, that was a name that always came up and they get referenced a lot by, by many bands as, um, a band that's yeah. influenced them and influenced the sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Stone Gossard was, uh, quoted as saying, it's the reason he started playing guitar. Just listen to 10 minute warning. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Although I actually met Stone, I think before that, and he was starting to noodle on guitar a bit already. But that, <laughs> I think that was the band that really kind of propelled him into um, getting serious about yeah. it. Um, you know, we, they, and then subsequently we uh, were a pretty big deal back in '83 and '84. Uh, when I used to see the band, the two biggest bands in the in the Seattle underground scene were You Men and Ten Minute Warning. Mm-hmm. So the fact that I actually ended up getting to play with my favorite band was pretty thrilling um but 10 minute warning and feedback both kind of imploded at around the same time at the end of of 84 and uh you know at that point i was basically between the two bands rehearsing about six days a week so i you know i i i became a a pretty adept bass player I, i guess um and and so when both bands imploded, I really had this idea of wanting to start a band that that sort of was an amalgam of the aesthetics of, of the two bands. Ten Minute Warning was kind of heavier, punkier, kind of more Stooges, Heartbreakers kind of influenced uh, with kind of a, a real dark kind of psychedelic edge. And and, and then Feedback was, was kind of cerebral and we fucked around with different time signatures and... Um, I liked qualities of both. And so I had this idea of trying to start a band that had both qualities. Um, and I had met, I had met uh, Jack and Dino through NERM because they'd been high school friends together and he'd come to a couple of our practices and uh, he gave me a tape of some stuff he'd been working on. So I basically approached him and I just, yeah, I, I knew that he was the guy I wanted to start a band with because I was really impressed with, the work he had done and the tape he had given me. And so I just called him up out of the blue and I said, Hey dude, you know, I'm bandless and I'd like to start a band with you. And I have an idea for what the band should sound like. And the rest is, you know, essentially history. Mm-hmm. Um, very cool. When I, um, once we, we knew you were, ha- we were going to have you on, I started to look for t- um, some vinyl from mm-hmm. some of the, some of those early artists that I mean, early bands that you mentioned even before Skin Yard, and there's, I didn't find many as far as um, LPs that were out for, mm-hmm. um, but I did know, but there were quite a few, not quite a few, but there were some compilations, and that's actually how we are our paths crossed. Um, like a ama- what's that? Deep Six. Yeah, the Deep Six album. Um, which has a really funny history between us anyway. So that's my brother there holding the album. We were in uh, Cleveland at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, probably it was my brother's bachelor party. So I don't know. Don't, don't ask me why we went to Cleveland for a bachelor party. <laughs> it's actually to go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And uh, one of the coolest things there was the Seattle exhibit, and the Deep Six album was on display there. That was probably, what, Paul, 15 years ago? Yeah, almost 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago now. And I was, so, uh, it's it's funny because when I learned about that album, it was like early 2000, 2005, 2006, around there. 
And I actually reached out to you, Daniel. Uh, this was almost 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> and I was like, I can't find this album anywhere. This was before the days of Discogs. And right. there really wasn't much even on eBay back then. And I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to hunt down this this record, Deep Six. Uh, I noticed that you were your head of CZ at the time. And you got back to me right away. And it's like, yeah, I have a couple. And I sent you a money order and mailed me a couple albums, a couple Deep Six <laughs> albums. <laughs> sent you a couple? Two. Yeah, I got two. I probably sold them to you at a price that I would never imagine these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got to uh, they've appreciated in value for sure since then. Yeah. And for what it's worth, you still have one of them. And then our our partner who is not on the call right now has the other one that. So it's not like they were flipped. They're uh, the yeah. prized possessions. Yeah. Yeah. I would never say. <laughs> yeah. Well, regarding then, to, 10 minute warning, there is a 10 minute warning record that I put out of the sessions we did in 1984 and uh, yes. came out a yep. couple of ago so recently right i, I yeah. came across one 10 minute warning ep that came out back in 83 i think it was before i think duff was still in the band then and it's yeah. super hard to find i can't find it anywhere uh, the seven. Uh, survival of the fittest it's yeah. uh yeah yeah but if you go to you can look at Bandcamp or discogs and look up uh 10 minute warning with the, with the number 10 um and yeah. i released uh, a record on cz actually um of of the sessions from 1984 that we recorded that during the pandemic jack and dino basically uh mixed the entire record or kind of remixed it in a sense uh from the original tapes so the the production quality is really solid and it sounds really good so cool yeah, fans who are interested um you know it's 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 a pretty pivotal band if you're interested in that history. Um, it's kind of the first band that really sort of marks the scene that was about to explode but hadn't yet. They're, mm -hmm. they're kind of right. kind of the band that was because there was a lot of punk bands prior before grunge kind of exploded. Well, I guess grunge exploded later, but for us that was living there, it all started in like you know eighty five, eighty six. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that it was really very punk rock and 10 minute warning really was that band that bridged uh, well, uh, you know, let me grab a copy i'll show it to you so, let's, yeah. although let's see what will show up <laughs> yeah, yeah. get it faded out yeah oh, that looks nice yeah oh, you can see it i just can't okay well, anyway, there's there's a quote on here from Jeff Ament. It says, 10 Minute Warning was the greatest part of, uh, w w was the greatest part of their mystique was that there were only a couple hundred of us at, who that witnessed it. 10 Minute Warning was the most important link in Seattle. It bridged the early hardcore scene with what they would eventually call grunge. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, whenever I read about the, the early days, it kind of, it mentions you, man, in the fastbacks. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of bridge from 10 minute warning and then to green river and that, and yeah. everything that happened after that. That's awesome. Pretty much. I mean, yeah, that's, that's pretty accurate really. And, and you men, you know, you men were very essential in, in part of that history too, but, but they were so distinct as a band that you can't necessarily say there's a through line from what they were doing to the grunge scene, other than they were so instrumental just in that whole underground scene. But musically, they were doing something that was unlike anything that anybody was doing, you know. So when you heard that, when you were experiencing that, did it did it uh, dawn on you that something really cool is about to happen? Or uh, what, what was that feeling like at the time? Uh, I don't think any of us. I think anybody that tells you that, yes, yes, something was happening, you could tell. I, 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 I say, no, you, no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. It, it, there, it was absolutely the case that you were there and like something cool was happening. You just didn't know what was about to happen. You know, there, there was, there was something in the water, it seemed. And, and, you know, there was definitely kind of this transitional period, but, but I mean, even in the early, in the early eighties, you know, you've probably read a bit about or heard about uh, blackouts, you know, the blackouts were, really important band and anybody from that later scene would probably talk about the blackouts specifically. They were, they were, you know, 
an incredible, amazing band. And they were they were kind of early contemporaries with early, early UMAP. Mm-hmm. So when I first got there, those were kind of the two bands that I was most uh, enamored with, was UMAP and Blackouts. And, and Blackouts left town kind of early. They went to San Francisco and then they went to Boston. And, you know, they're, they're, in their entire career, they released all of 14 songs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and kind of broke up but like two of the members ended up later in ministry and and you know one of them was bill rieflin and then bill rieflin ended up also playing with king crimson for a while and <clears throat> um but really where the scene seemed to begin to coalesce i would say was was probably uh 84 85 that's kind of when things really started happening in a way that seemed like you know, something was different, right? Um, I mean, you know, U Men's first EP was 84. Uh, they had another EP in 85, the same year that Green River had the Come On Down EP. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, you know, and then 86, you had the first Screaming Trees, you had the Deep Six record. And then Did- things re- really started happening more like in 87. That's when a lot of records started happening kind of all at once. Yeah. Tim, could you tell us a little bit more about how Deep Six came about? I know that, I mean, there's print out there and stuff, and I've read pretty much everything I could imagine on, on yeah. that album, but kind of it, what, what, those groups that came together for that compilation? Well, so I, I presume your your listeners know that D, that CZ was originally a label that was launched by Chris Hamzik mm-hmm. and his then-girlfriend, Tina Cassell. Um, they came to, and I my understanding was that she had some money. He had some ambition. He had started a, a small recording studio, uh, which later became reciprocal um, in the old triangle building. And so basically he had a studio and they together kind of started a label. And, you know, I think initially the idea was to release this local compilation of bands uh, as at least to some degree, a, a kind of almost like a, a calling card, you know, like I'm going to put out this record, I'm going to engineer all the bands and it will be like, Hey, look at this record that we did at my studio. Um, you know, and he did that and then he did the deep six comp and, and, I'm not entirely sure exactly how he made the choice of all the bands. Um, I do remember very clearly that I was the one who talked him into human. He didn't want to do human. Mm. And I was like, dude, nobody else on this record is a known quantity. Yeah. You men are, you men are kind of a big deal right now. I mean, they always kind of were, but it, it, it was sort of like, if you don't put human on here, you're going to have an even harder time selling this record. And it wasn't even sure that they would kind of say yes, because um, they kind of lived in their own universe. Um, and I'm not even entirely sure how Skinyard ended up on it, other than it might have just been my persistence. But but I, I you know, I talked Chris into getting the human in there and they did, you know, one song and only one song. Um and it was an interesting concept. You know, everybody had, I believe it was two days in the studio, one to record, one to mix. And uh, it was Chris and then one member representative from each band in the studio with him to do whatever songs they did. So, you know, Buzz was here for that. Jack and there was here for, uh, for, for our songs. I, I think it was, um, I think it was Kim Thiel that was in there for the Sound Garden. You know, Buzz was there for Melvin's et cetera. Um, and you know, he put the record out and, um, it didn't take long for him to realize that, you know, he might sell a hundred in Seattle and everything outside of Seattle was going to be like pulling teeth, you know, getting distribution, <laughs> you're a brand new label, you have one title, uh, distributors were very small back then and, and, you know, largely regional. And here's this record with a bunch of bands nobody's ever heard outside of Seattle and even then in Seattle, probably only within a very small circle of people. So it didn't take long, I think, before Chris really came to understand that like, oh, this kind of sucks and this is hard and I can go into the studio day after day after day and have work and get paid. 
and I've got my bed and I've got a futon on top and I've got, you know, 1700 records underneath. And uh, <laughs> so what Steve, else do you need? <laughs> yeah. And he's like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. You know, uh-huh. and I, I, I get that, you know, uh, but, but, you know, um, Skinny Art had just finished recording our first record and we were in the process of trying to shop it. And we got a few nice letters back, but nobody wanted to put it out. And probably because they really didn't know what the hell to think about it, because it's it's kind of a record that just sounds like nothing else. It doesn't even sound like other skin art, ultimately. Right? Um, but I, you know, I, I felt that that we had a good record, and we were a band that was doing something unique. And I'm like, well, you know, if nobody else is going to put it out, I'll put it out. I don't know how, but I feel pretty strongly I can figure it out. And so I just went to Chris. I'm just like, you know, you don't really want to do your label anymore. You have a whole bunch of deep six records. Uh, You know, let's have a conversation where I can just take it over. You let me run with it. And I'll just basically work on selling off the, the deep six inventory and pay you as I go. And meanwhile i'll put out our record and you know i wasn't really sure what i was going to do after putting out skin yard mm-hmm. uh, but what i discovered is i had a knack for it and i really enjoyed the process um and i was friends with a bunch of other people in a bunch of other bands and i was like well shit you know i you know like we were good we were really close with coffin break and so we're like well, we should, you know i want to put out a coffin break sample and we played with, you know, this band Vexed that were also unlike any other band in the town in, in Seattle at the time. And um, so it just seemed like an obvious thing. It was a, it was a fun hobby initially. You know, I was working in restaurants and saving tip money and, you know, and putting out another single. And, uh, and then in 87, I guess it was 88, I think, I started working at Sub Pop. Okay. And it was Bruce and John and me. And at that point, I think, I think by then I'd put out probably nine releases on CZ. And uh, I was responsible for overseeing all the sales and all the distribution for Sub Pop and, and uh, building their direct to retail department where we sold music directly to stores all over America. But even then, we didn't have a lot of a lot in our catalog, so we had to start bringing stuff in to just distribute. So I was in charge of that as well to make, to make these orders worth stores, you know, to make it worth their while. Because the thing is we didn't do anything on terms. Everything was direct COD. And that was kind of revolutionary at that time. Like nobody did that. We're like, well, you have guarantees that you'll get our product and you get it cheaper because there's no middleman. But the flip side is, you know, you have to pay us up front. And it worked out. It worked out. Uh, and, and it was also became a good vehicle for me also to distribute CZ through sub in that same way. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, it, it was, um, you know, the whole story I never really knew, but I've always associated CZ, that label, as one of the iconic, historic kind of Seattle labels. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's exciting to be able to talk to somebody that was actually part of it and, and living it. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now, I mean, you, uh, up, and then there was CZ. You know, we were kind of like, we were the little right. we we're the little brother. Although Deep Six came out before Sub Pop existed as a record label. Yeah, oh. you know, another uh, kind of a, a mythical album oh. compilation album that I've always read about is the the first Pirate Victory cassette uh-huh. that you, I think that you just did on your own, right? Yeah, uh, I did. I did. And I've never seen one. I've only read about it. I know a lot more about another Pirate Victory, which had, was actually pressed in vinyl, but the first one in 86. Pause this for a moment. I'm going to close my front door because my dog is barking. No problem. Yeah. Come on. Okay, let's see. Maybe she'll stop barking. We should. We should. <laughs> uh, no worries. No, we yeah, can no problem. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, the Parrot Victory cassette, um, I think it was 86, if I remember, mm-hmm. I want to say, 
I'm trying to remember everybody that was on it. I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, um, what I've read is in Ten Minute Warning is on it. Soundgarden. Ten Minute Warning is uh, on Skin it. Skin Yard, of course. Skin Yard is on it. Um, yeah, Stuck in a Plan, I think, was a song. Uh, Vex was on it. Uh, Mental Mannequin, I think, which was um, Gordon Raphael's old band, and he he was he was a producer that that uh, produced the first Strokes record. Oh, um, Horrible Truth, I think, was on it. Uh, this weird band that few people ever talk about called the Probes, which was this uh, Northwest School uh, band. Um, I was a big fan, and that Northwest School was was uh, where Jim Tillman went to school and where Stone went to school and the probes on school. I'm trying to remember. I think I think there must have been one or two other people in bands that went there too. It was kind of a, a private arts and humanities school on Capitol Hill. Um, that's where I that's where I first met Stone when he was 14. And I remember his favorite band was Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So how did you uh, how did you release that? Was that all completely made in house by you? Um, did yeah. you go to distribution for that? Or? Oh, I didn't have to. It, it just it all sold locally. Oh, okay, it's two hundred and fifty. They were hand numbered. Um, I was going to Seattle Central Community College, and I was in their uh, print technology program where we do like layout and film work, and we had to learn to run presses, and you know, it was kind of beginning to end, and. Um, you know, you could a lot of what you could do is you do whatever projects you want to do, and so that was cool. I got to do that. I got to do this little little stapled uh, skin yard press thing with like different color ink, and, and that's actually where I laid out the first uh, skin yard single and also the first skin yard album. I did that all while I was there. Awesome. So the cassette was very cool. cool. Yeah, the cassette was prior to the record, but it was from the same set of recordings. Okay. So, so yeah, like the 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 ten minute warning song on there is from the same session that I put out the ten minute warning record, but a completely different mix. Soundgarden was from uh, the very first demo that Jack did with them. Um, yeah, Skinnyard was one of the songs from our first record. Just. Just, you know, all friends, basically, and just all music that I liked. And uh, I found a place locally that could mass produce cassette tapes and, you know, just did 250, numbered them and got them in stores. And, you know, they sold. They're all gone. Yeah, that, oh, they're all gone. I, I literally have one copy and that's it. So. <laughs> well, at least you know where one is now, Paul. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I've never seen one. And then later, the another Perry Victory comp. I just really liked the title. And so when I was getting ready to put that compilation together, um, I just liked the title from the first one. So I just called it Another Pair of Victory. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the only compilation of Dead Seattle God Bands. Yeah, and as <laughs> far as I know, that's the Deep Six and Another Pirate is the only releases from Malfunction, right? Correct. Well, they did, uh, they later put together that record posthumously. Yeah, right. By- but but yeah, the those are the only records initially. I you know prior prior to the loose groove malfunction release, that was the only malfunction that ever got properly released. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Now, Daniel, are you a uh, we we know you're a musician, obviously, and um, but are you a re- collector at all? Do you collect oh, yeah. records? Are you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, not as much as I used to. Um, when I, when I moved out of Seattle in 2003, I think back then I had about 3,500 records. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. And I sold the bulk of them. I think I, I think I came to California with about 750. And then for a long time, they were just in boxes in the garage and my turntable. Actually, I didn't have a turntable for a bunch of years. And a few years ago, I finally was like, I need to bring the records out. I needed to get a turntable so i got a new turntable and then of course i started collecting records and uh, now i'm probably up to around i don't know 12 or 1300 i i I buy them sparingly i still have more cds than anything Mm. because they're easier to store and and i'm not somebody who thinks that cds sound like garbage i think they sound fine (laughs) 
But I do like I like I like the sound. I like the warmth of vinyl, and I just like the aesthetic of vinyl. I like the size. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I love it when you have a gatefold and and the notes. They smell better. They smell. (laughs) They do smell a lot better. Yeah, that's something. uh, Something we talk about on this podcast is is random different variants of albums, um, limited pressings. Mm-hmm. Uh, like your like Deep Six, we talked about quite a bit. That's only three thousand. Is that a right number for for that uh, album? Two thousand. Two thousand. Okay. And uh, and the first Skin Yard album is is very collectible because it was low print. Uh, what I read is fourteen hundred. Does that seem about right? Uh, probably. <laughs> I and, don't. It, <laughs> and it was the first album that Jack and Dino engineered, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so it's super collectible. Um, and, 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 you know, some of the songs are on a four track, so they sound surprisingly good considering most of that record is done on this weird uh, proprietary recording deck that used this cassette that looked kind of like a beta max. And it was, it was a uh, 12 track hmm. and um, which made it, you know, it was proprietary. So it never really stuck because you had you know, the same equipment, both to record and to mix. And, um, and then we had a couple songs that were four track, and but yeah, so that what was are, his first official record. Mm-hmm. Very cool. What are what are some of your, you know, more the, the crown jewels in your collection that you, anything you want to talk about or oh, excited yeah. about that mo- people like us probably don't see every day? You know, I don't tend to be. I don't tend to think in those terms so much. Um. And I know I have some records there that are probably like, oh shit, but um, I don't, I don't <laughs> like I, I'm to the point now where I'm, I'm not as driven by collectability as, as I am just to have music. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so more often than not, for instance, if I already have something on CD, I'm probably not going to turn on and buy it on vinyl. So now I just buy vinyl that I don't already have. Um, I know that I have um just i guess weird weird obscure stuff like first pressings of liquid liquid old art band from the 80s in new york and uh there's a record called um see now i'm gonna have this brain fart because i have to think um (laughs) just weird like weird obscure stuff that probably most people like i don't even know who the hell that is you know uh old old bands from there's a there was a, a band when we were on tour that we played with from atlanta georgia called 86 I have a couple of their records. I, um, you know, mostly just obscure stuff. I don't even know if it's worth anything. You know, I have, I have all early U men pressing and stuff like that. Um, then so there's just have- obscure things that I happen to love that like, there's a band from Athens, Georgia called the barbecue killers. Um, yeah. Most people don't know of them. No. They're amazing. I think they put out one record and that was it. You know, check them out. I have to check them out. Yeah, for sure. Now, I know an, another Pirate Victory is something that you personally put out. There was mm-hmm. a really limited 300 run on Orange with the the large hole, the 45 hole. Do you have yeah. Do you have any of those? I do. Um, so there was actually there was 300 on Orange and 300 on Yellow. Oh, okay. And it's kind of funny because I was just talking to somebody this very morning about that record. Uh, be- because I just have this idea of like, let's fuck shit up and let's do a 12 inch record that has a large hole that you have to use an adapter to play. So <laughs> three, 300 on one color and 300 on another. And to this day, it's still one of the favorite things I ever did just because it's so like, what, why would you do that? It's cool. It's because, different. I, because I can, that's why. <laughs> so I was, I was, I'm actually getting ready to put out what may end up being the very last thing I ever put out on CZ, which is going to be a, uh, a collection called Skin Yard Select. And it's a, it's going to be a, a, a little slipcase box set of seven uh, different 45s. Oh, cool. And, and so it'll be 14 songs total, and it includes uh, material with all four of our drummers. So there's, I think, four songs with Matt on them, Matt on it, including one song that nobody's ever heard. It's never been released from like 80, uh, 85 with Matt Cameron. And then there's like alternate mixes, remixes, um, some different versions. 
and, and a lot of songs that were on records, uh, but they've been remixed, but they've never been on on seven inch format. And so each one's going to be in different color vinyl. Uh, it's going to be limited pressing, <clears throat> and eventually we'll release the whole thing digitally, just as an album. Cool. But I was, talking, was, uh, I was talking to a pressing it, plant about the big hole this morning. So oh, yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> was Greg Gilmore in any of those? Did he play in Skin Yard with you, or just ten minute morning? So Greg Gilmore, uh, when we first started, our first drummer that we actually brought in to try to play was Greg. Okay, and it just it just didn't jive just didn't feel right and he wasn't really interested and so then we went to matt so so we basically went to the two drummers of the two bands i'd been in prior and, and greg you know greg was sort of more of an incendiary player um and so i thought wow this would be cool but but we were doing this stuff that was a lot more cerebral and, and more rigid in terms of structure and and that's kind of not where where greg was coming from Time. So he wasn't really interested. And Matt ended up being like the perfect drummer because Matt, Matt, anything you can come up with, any any idea you might have, however complex or weird, Matt will just kind of go, yeah, I can do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and of course, that that then makes you start doing more stuff like that because, you know, you can do stuff mm-hmm. that nobody else can pull off. But after a while, that also becomes a trap because you're like, you know, it becomes a little it starts to become a little too cerebral over time. Mm-hmm. Um so later, you know, we had Matt, and after Matt left, uh, we had Jason Finn for just about six months, and um, and I really liked playing with him, even though sort of profic- he was probably at that time not the most uh, proficient drummer, so to speak, but he was a feel drummer, and he had really great feel, and I always liked the stuff he did with us because it was just different from anything else we did, um, but he was only with us for six months. And so then we had this gap. And so first we did a couple, we had Steve Weed from TAD. Um, We played two shows and he was good, but it didn't feel right. And then we did two shows with, um, with Greg Gilmore as well. And again, that just Mm -hmm. didn't quite feel right. Um, Let me see. I actually have a pulled a spreadsheet up that, um, I don't remember what years this this was. Just for our listeners, Greg Gilmore went on to play drums for Mother Love Bone. Yes. That's why we brought him up. Yeah, he did. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not finding the years right now, but but it was we played two shows each with them. But and, and a lot of people say, you know, they were also uh, you know, in skin air, but they kind of worked. I mean, literally. Oh, you know what? It looks like I'm wrong. It looks like we went from Matt to Steve Weed and then Greg Gilmore. So that that was in 1986. So it was like Steve Weed, we played two shows in July. And then Greg Gilmore, we played two shows in September. And after that, in October of 86, we played with, with Jason Finn. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, the the the, the seven inch set skin yard select basically has Matt, Jason, Scott, and then Barrett Martin, who of course was our final drummer, and went on after that to play with with uh, with Screamy Trees and with Mad Season and you know a ton of other stuff, um, you know, including he did a Mark Eitzel record. Um, to Atara was a band he was doing with Peter Buck for a while. Um, he stay he continues to stay incredibly busy. Walking Papers, that was another band he played with, with Duff. Very cool. So what, what was it like? I mean, I'm thinking back, like, in the 90s, it seemed like, to us anyway, we're on the East Coast, so we were like, trends move much slower over here. But it was just, <laughs> everything had just exploded. And then it was Pearl Jam, Nirvana, and that's, you know, all, <laughs> any, and anything that came out of Seattle was what we wanted to buy and listen to. And, uh, but you being there when it was all, it all started. And it seemed like, I don't know if this is, but it seems like all of the bands were somewhat friendly. They all kind of knew each other, supported each other. We see a lot of in the records, like in the runouts, we would say, well, which was, it was, and one of them was like one band. Yeah, one of the, the green river 
a Green River album that says by malfunction in the run out. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. And a lot of you guys play in the in there's a rotation of um of members and and play in each other's bands. What was it like like going from that scene where you guys were just doing it because that was the kind of music you liked and wanted to play and now things are gradually or not gradually but just exploding. Um well it was it was it was kind of a double edged sword, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I've always said that it it kind of sucked in a way, but it didn't. I mean, from a business perspective, obviously it didn't because suddenly people were getting signed. But the problem was, in my mind, is that it, you know, that whole scene happened very, very organically. Um, right. And it happened in relative obscurity because back then, you know, most most bands would literally be on tour and they would come to Portland and then they would go to Vancouver. Like a lot of bands would skip Seattle altogether. And so I can't tell you how many times, you know, a bunch of us would like drive down to Portland or drive up to Vancouver to see shows. Cause um, you know, I mean, there was obvious exceptions, you know, there was a lot of bands that came through in like 83, 84 when we had the club Metropolis, but, but to a large degree, a lot of bands just skip Seattle altogether. So it was a really small little scene and, you know, the shows were maybe 200 people and that was a packed show. Um, but all your friends were there, you know, so we were all <laughs> supporting each other. We were all fans of each other. And for the most part, it wasn't really that it wasn't terribly competitive. Um, I, I do know that early on, like Skin Yard, Soundgarden had some competition just because aesthetically we shared a lot of the same things. And so we were often being considered for a lot of the same shows, like who's, you know, who's going to get the Brad Bain show or Bad Brain show or, or who's, who's going to get, you know, the Faith No More show. And, you know, we, we played once with Faith No More and Soundgarden played once with Faith No More. And, um, so there was, there was, it was more like the competition for opening slots for bigger bands but it was really a great scene when everybody knew everybody and everybody supported each other and went to each other's shows. And, you know, you know, I guess in the same way that we, you know, ended up sort of with the family tree incestuously playing with you with each other in different bands, you know, also over time, probably, you know, sleeping with each other's girlfriends as well. That kind of thing. <laughs> but, you know, where most people from the outside look at sort of the, you know, grunge being this thing that happened in 1991 right yeah and, uh, anesthesia and you had you 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 had pearl jam's first record you had facelift uh, you had you know never mind bad butter finger eight-way santa like it's it's kind of stunning when you look at that whole list of the records that came out in in 91 but you know prior to that you know like 88 you had the first Nirvana record. You had, you know, the Human EP, Step on a Bug. You had Ultra Mega OK on SST. You had Rehab Doll from Green River on Sub Pop, right? Invisible Lantern also on SST by Screaming Trees. Um, there was a lot going on, but it wasn't happening. It, it hadn't exploded on the world stage yet, right? Right. And so... To all of us that were living there, you know, 87, 88, 89, it was kind of a big deal. But it really was like 89 is when things began to shift. Mm -hmm. As you had, you know, Screaming Trees had already gone to, to SST. And keep in mind, 87, 88, SST was one of the biggest indies in America. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Soundgarden was with SST too, I think, right for Ultra. Ultra Mega was on SST. Yeah. yeah. So Soundgarden, Soundgarden originally, right, was on, was on, well, first originally, I guess, was on CZ, Deep Six. And, you know, then they were on um, Sub Pop. And yeah, in 80, 88 is when they went to, uh, to, to SST. And then 89, a and M, right? A and I mean, they were the they were kind of the first band that came out on, and you know, and then after that, you know, Love Bone came out on Mercury in 1990, and then 91 was just nuts. So, so what happened though 
all of a sudden everybody's getting signed all of a sudden everybody's competing for the A&R people who are kind of coming into town all the time. Um, and all of a sudden there's all of these bands that none of us had ever heard of playing at all, at all of our favorite clubs. And all of a sudden the community that had existed prior was gone. And, right. and that, you know, I mean, you know, I guess innocence lost or whatever, like everybody, <laughs> everybody benefited, but it wasn't the same scene anymore. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of us began resenting all of the attention and, you know, all of the magazine coverage and every a and person. You know, I mean, a and people were getting sent to Seattle with, you know, marching orders. And the marching order is you need to sign a band from Seattle. Mm -hmm. And it didn't necessarily matter who, who the band was. I mean, it did, but but suddenly you had all these bands that you'd never heard of coming in from, from the suburbs around Seattle that sounded like, you know, you had your Pearl Jam bands, you had your Sound Gardenish bands, you had your, you know, like even, even at CC Records, the demos we used to get was all kinds of music. And once everything started becoming a big deal, we literally had a box for the Nirvana demos. We had a box for the Sound Garden demos. We had a box for the Tad demos. Because so many of the <laughs> dance had tried to sound exactly like them, exactly, and it, you know, I get it, but it was also kind of disappointing because at that point you feel like the, you know, the 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 breadth of originality was mm -hmm. just kind of going by the wayside, and everybody was at that point, I feel, beginning to create music for the wrong reasons. Right. When Seattle started, people were doing it for the love of doing it. And the community that, that grew around that was, was really amazing, you know? And the other thing that happened, of course, in 91 uh, was that that's when the World Wide Web came into existence. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, so the, the, the year that grunge broke was also the year that, that the World Wide Web came into existence and with that email. And, uh, you know, so I, I actually still believe that we're never going to see an organic music scene like that ever again. Mm -hmm. It was definitely, it was something special for sure. It was yeah. definitely something special. Um, you know, so you mentioned some of the stuff that you're doing now, um, the 10 minute warning, 84 recordings pressing, which I need to, I need to get a copy of that. Um, it's a good record. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I, I need to pick that up. Um, and then you also have, uh, you talked about the slip case with the, the seven, um, the, uh, the, the select collection. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. When does that come out? Uh, well, because pressing lead times aren't a year anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be some point this year. Okay, cool. Right. We'll, we'll look forward to that. We know who I, the artist is going to be for all the outside stuff. I just got, uh, an email back from Jeff Kleinsmith who, He's probably going to do the design for it. I've been in touch with Jack and you know this morning. I talked to three different pressing plants, and everybody's turnaround is like two to three months. That's um, a lot better. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we have the songs picked out. It, it part of it's going to be dependent on uh, Jack's time because he has to basically master everything. You know, to wave files to send out, and and I have to find out really what Jeff Kleinsmith's availability is. Um, and it's possible somebody else may end up assembling it. I don't know, but but uh, it's going to be a really nice package for sure. And is this starting a trend of um, you know so getting some of those old releases back out into the ether? Probably not. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll take what we can get, right? It's, so. I mean, it's you know, it used to be really inexpensive to to yeah. produce vinyl, and that's just not the case anymore. So even even though now the the you know the window of time is less, I don't have to wait you know twelve to fifteen months. It's it used to be cheaper to do vinyl than it was to produce CDs yeah. in the day, and now it's like it's cost prohibitive. Um, you know, I've had a lot of people you know say, "When are you going to reissue the Skinyard records?" And I'm like, "Probably never." Like I'm not convinced there's a good <laughs> audience out there to warrant the cost of pressing. You know. And even if we were to do 500 records, we're going to have to sell 350 to be a break even. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I don't know. That's, uh, you know, I mean, the 10 minute warning record, I'm still not break even, break even at that. Yeah. yeah. It was a, you know, like per record when everything is factored in, it's like 16 bucks a record. It's like, yeah. It's a, it's a fortune. Well, <laughs> yeah, even even for record stores too. Um, I'm really good friends with uh, a big record store here in Maryland, and um, you know, they're they make a couple dollars off of a forty dollar yeah. record. You know, so it's there's not a lot of money in it. Um, you know, once everybody gets their piece of the pie, so to speak. So, yeah. um, but we do appreciate you releasing something for us to to listen to and to add to our collections. And um, when I get that 10 minute warning album, I'll make sure that I get it directly from your website or, or however uh, it'll it's, benefit you the most instead of going well, to Discogs. 10 minute warning dot bandcamp dot com. Okay. Yeah. Number, number 10, one zero minute warning dot bandcamp. Yeah. You definitely pick that up. And, and the, and the yeah. color vinyl is gorgeous. Oh, okay. Great. Love so it. is it two different variants? There's black and then this this black and blue splatter with, with white in there. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool. Awesome. Very good. So we didn't really talk about Green River very much, did we? Yeah, well, I was actually going to bring up, I, I was going to bring up uh, what is the quintessential um, band or record that from from the early grunge era that you would say you know that's that's my desert island album or it's the one that i really um think that you know if anyone's gonna get a you know early grunge record to add to their collection this one should be it for collectability for music whatever the case may be um i would probably say one of the first two green river records on sub so the first the first Green River record is is Come On Down, which was on a home cut from '85, and I love that record. Uh, but but I don't think it's the best sounding record. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's it's to me that's like if you really want to start at ground zero, get Come On Down. Um, but I think I think Green River only got big, mm-hmm. and I think by the time Sub Pop put out Dry as a Bone. And then rehab doll that really just shows a band in absolute top form. Um, and they were they were such an amazing live band. I mean, they were just you know uh, I can't say enough about how great it was to see Green River. Like every time you ever saw them, kind of before Soundgarden, and then once Soundgarden kind of it, it was it, and then it was kind of like. Who do you think about in terms of this band, this scene as it's exploding in front of our eyes? It was Green River and Sauber. Um, but to me, Green River really embodies the aesthetic to me of what the whole grunge scene was ultimately about. You know, and then after they broke up, you know, the, the band <laughs> split off to Pearl Jam and Mud Honey, and you know, subsequently, I still think Mud Honey is the band that ultimately sort of carried the torch that. That Green River first lit, um, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I'm still amazed that they're still a band. They're still great live, and they're still putting out amazing records. So, you know, Green River is fairly short lived, right? They have those three records, and they're not even all full lengths. Mm-hmm. Um, from a collectability standpoint, you probably want to get the early records. However, in the last few years, Sub Pop reissued those two Sub Pop. Titles, those two, two Green River records, uh, remixed and remastered. Jack and Dino did a really fantastic job with it, and they do sound significantly better. Mm-hmm. So, you know, from a, from an oral standpoint, I think those records, that version, even though it's probably not as collectible, they sound fantastic. Sounds better. And similarly, uh, if 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 you've ever heard the original SST. Um, Ultra Mega OK record versus the Sub Pop reissue that again Jack and Dino uh, remixed the whole thing. It's night and day. Mm-hmm. So when Ultra Mega OK came out on SST, the entirety of Seattle was just like so disappointed because <laughs> we, knew, we knew what they sounded like and we knew what that record should have sounded like. Yeah. And From what I read, Soundgarden was disappointed too, right? Well, I never understood why they let it come out, but mm-hmm. you can ask them that if you have the chance. 
if it had been me, I'd have been like, well, no, that's no, this, this has to be remixed, you know. Um, but Jack finally got around to remixing it, and now it sounds absolutely glorious and spectacular. And it's it's so satisfying to actually hear that record all these years later to finally sound like it was supposed to sound like when it first came out, you know. Now it's ex- now it's exciting again. Yeah, I picked a copy up of that, and it's. Yeah, I'm an audiophile guy. I don't know if you've listened to any of our previous episodes, but uh, my role in this is is usually sound quality, and yeah. um, I have a you know custom tube set up, a really nice turntable. I, I buy the um, high end pressings, and uh, when that came out, I was so stoked. I had picked it up, um, and uh, yeah, it's it definitely definitely cooks the eardrums. I love it. Yeah. So yeah, for 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 fans that want to d- dig deep and go early, you know, go to Green River. Mm-hmm. Great, so, yeah. So I've, uh, it, I've, I've come on down, and there's Green River has some. They have a seven inch that I think is very collectible. Uh-huh. Um, together will never. That's um, green, and I think there's only two fifty is the pressing of that. So um, and I sold it, and I. Kick myself that I did. <laughs> we all they have all, one of those experiences. Yeah. No, they the also one I, have a... I, I had I had a, a low number Nirvana Love Buzz oh. that I sold twenty some odd years ago for ninety five dollars. Oh. That was a lot then. So yeah, yeah I guess. <laughs> I what would it be now? Five thousand dollars or something. Yeah, but, I mean, even, depending yeah. on the condition and if it's a low number, I bet you could maybe even get five figures for it. Yeah, really? Seriously? I, yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's also there's a lot of counterfeits of that, so the original ones are t- super valuable right now. I mean, I was at Sub Pop when they came out, and I was I was selling those to stores <laughs> directly, and I should have grabbed more than like I think at the time I grabbed two. Oh. I probably should have grabbed. I should, probably should have just like bought, you know, thirty, <laughs> and just, right. you know, and then you know, down payment for a mortgage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I still don't have one. It's been on my want list. It's funny. I know the prices of things on my want list more than things in my collection because I'm looking for them all all the time. Yeah. So like that that deep six, it was that's something that was on my list, and I was I was so excited to see it sealed and had to jump at it. And the the whole provenance of like coming directly from you, I, to me, I saved the receipt and that's <laughs> a really cool, cool collectible. Yeah. Well, let me ask you something. So we we talked briefly about the um, the another Pyrrhic victory with a big hole. Mm-hmm. So back in the day, <clears throat> I. Um, I took 10 of 10 copies of it and I had everybody in every band autograph a copy. And one of them was stolen and I know who stole it. And actually somebody not that long ago reached out to me and said, Hey, is this real? And I'm like, yeah, that's the copy that uh, I, I won't, I won't list. I won't mention his name on the podcast, even though I really want to. <laughs> It sounds like he that. deserves it. So I got that. He stole my original Nirvana demo tape and my original Soundgarden demo tape. Oh, and uh, anyway, I still have nine copies and it's signed by everybody, including Andrew Wood. And I am like, all right, what would one of these sell for? I have no clue. You you guys are the expert. What do you think? It's good. I mean, just the regular version of that. There's so few. There's only three. It's an orange, one of the orange ones or yellow ones that are that are signed. Uh, correct. It's kind of it. I, but it's signed by everybody in the band, you know, including Andrew Wood. Who's, Andrew Wood, yeah, and uh, Jeff and Stoner are both on there. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Everybody signed it. Yeah, that that might be something for um, you know, like Heritage Auction House or something like that right, to yeah. appraise it. I'm actually. And, Getting in touch with Heritage because I have some early original Nirvana posters that I think I can get an awful lot for. If you have time, not not right this second, but if you have easy access to them, send us some pictures. We'd love to just yeah. just to see okay. it. Sure, yeah. yeah. And if if you have four to sell, um, <laughs> we might be interested. Maybe out of my purse or anything. Can you, <laughs> can you afford it? <laughs> uh, Chad, Chad will buy mine for me. Okay. So. <laughs> 
Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, Daniel, for taking so much time with us and uh, sitting down, uh, reminiscing on the old days. Um, we love hearing the history of grunge um, and to have somebody that was there from the beginning. Um, it's just, we're honored to have you on the show. And uh, we, thank you. We, yeah. We, um, we loved hearing about your collection, the items that you released in the past, the items that you re- released recently and coming up in the future. We're super stoked about that. And um, yeah, anytime uh, you want to come back on the show, if you have any more stories or whatever, uh, reach out, let us know. We'd love to have you. You, you know, as soon as I get off, I'm going to suddenly like rifle through and go, oh, God, I can't believe I didn't remember this record and this record and this record. So we could always yeah. film another show. That's not a problem. <laughs> right. well, it's, it's yeah, we love hearing the story. It's been uh, a lot of fun, and I, I appreciate you asking me to be on. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, and a special thank you to Jake Harwood for the outro and intro music. Uh, we really appreciate that. And um, keep spinning the good stuff, everyone. Uh, and uh, check out vmgvinyl.com if you want your uh, vinyl records graded and encapsulated uh that's it for episode nine uh, appreciate it and we'll see you next time yeah.